joined SASDOC a little while ago and are part of their founder circles. It's been absolutely brilliant for us. We first came into it to further our community, our reach, our network, and to learn from some of the world-class speakers that SASDOC has come and speak. And I have to say, it has been absolutely superb for us. Welcome to the SAS Revolution Show. Griffin Parry, uh, founder and CEO of Meta. Welcome, Griffin. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, great to have you here. Do you prefer uh, being called Griffin or Griff? I see Griff is uh, showing up there. I'm always Griff, uh, except when always I'm Griff. My mum. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. Uh, well, we'll we'll go with Griff. Uh, but uh, welcome to the podcast, Griff. Um, so we always kind of start off. We want to you know get to know a little bit more about the guest, uh, but. As a person, not just obviously, we know that you're the founder and CEO of Meter, and we're going to get into that uh, a little bit. But tell us a little bit more about who is uh, Griff Parry. Ooh, uh, I am. Uh, I guess I'm. My, I have a career of two parts. So I started off being uh, working in in corporates in media and TV. So I spent most of my sort of growing time at Sky. I was there for a long time, and then I've been a, a founder uh, so twice over. So this is my second radio terms of who I am. I'm quite calm, quite considered. I have sort of a servant leader style. You know, I, I see it as my job to sort of create the environment for other people to do great work. Um, and I hope I'm quite personable. I like chatting anyway. Good, uh, good stuff. And based in the UK, uh, I'm assuming? Based in the, based in the UK, yeah, no, well, uh, leafy West London. I talked to you from Chiswick. Okay. Very cool. Well, good stuff, Griff. And so uh, I think you, you said there that you're a, it's your second rodeo. So Meter is the the second company you founded. Was the first company a SaaS company? It was. It was a cloud services company focused on the video game sector. So we basically provided a back end as a service um, to video games and, and the gambling industry. So it's called GameSparks. Okay, uh, very cool. And uh, if you don't mind sharing, like what? Uh, what was the conclusion of that before Sumita? Did you did you have an exit? What what happened in, in between that and then moving to Meta? Uh, we we did we sold it to Amazon um, about five years ago. Okay, very cool. And then I, I did see Amazon on your LinkedIn. So was that the the earnout period of uh, uh, working with Amazon for a couple of years? Uh, three years, but it, uh, it was actually it three years. was it was within Amazon, but it was in AWS. So we we spent three years sort of in um, leadership roles in, in AWS, sort of focused on the goats market and the product side. But it was, uh, you know, I'm a founder, so I don't really like work. I prefer to work for myself than other people, but um, it was actually a really interesting time. I mean, AWS is a fascinating company and they're, um, they're as successful as they are for, for a bunch of good reasons. And we got to see a lot of that, which was great. Yeah. No, good stuff. Yeah. I mean, we, we work with AWS quite a lot and uh, I think the caliber of people that they have is, is great so very uh, impressive organization so uh so first SaaS company exited to amazon great stuff and then you founded a company called meter tell us a little bit about the founding story there and what what it does cool i'll tell you the founding story and then it becomes clear what it does because it's actually rooted in it so i'm actually going to take you back to our first startup so at Gamesbox, we, we deployed usage-based pricing, which made a lot of sense for us and worked really well for us. It wasn't as prevalent in software at the time. But, uh, but yeah, it was an unusual choice, but it worked really well. We, we, have, we primarily priced on the basis of players, but we had loads of other qualifying criteria and sort of add-ons and stuff like that. We experienced a lot of pain deploying and managing usage-based pricing. So it worked for us, but there were there were some tricky aspects to it. Just to throw a few examples, like our billing operations were really painful. So at the end of every month, sort of working out what's put on the invoice for which customer was difficult and was a Heath Robinson spreadsheet based system that was error prone, didn't scale very well, didn't deal with complexity. So that was a real headache. And then we saw a whole bunch of other problems that we saw as disconnected at the time, but realized eventually we're, at, we're all connected. So our sales teams and our customer success teams 
really needed to have up to date, basically real time information about what our customers were using and how that converted to spend. And that information wasn't readily available to them. And that caused a lot of pain, a lot of friction difficulties for them. And the same is actually true of the customer. So the customers wanted to know how much they were using at any given moment, how that was converting to spend, what it might mean for the bill at the end of the month when maybe they were in mid month. It, it wasn't good enough just to provide a, an invoice once a month with a single line item. They, they need to, to have granular information about usage and spend and, and have that pretty much sort of whenever they wanted it. I'll give you, I'll chuck one more example and forecasting was always a real nightmare. So, you know, we needed to forecast what our revenues were to make uh, investment decisions with confidence. You know, we're a startup, we don't have unlimited resources. We needed to be careful about how much we were spending, but um, also be aggressive. And so we needed to forecast our revenues and um, that's really hard because you needed to forecast what your usage was and that was difficult to know. And over time we realized that was actually a data science problem and, and we could have done it, but it was, it was hard. Actually, I'll, I'll chuck in one other thing as well is we also worry constantly about our gross margins because our pricing didn't perfectly align the revenues we received from our customers with, the, with our costs of servicing those customers, which meant that we had some great customers with a very high margin and some naughty step customers, which were low margin or even loss making in some cases. We needed to keep careful track of that and we needed to do it with quite a laborious manual process that we could only do infrequently. And we really wanted that information sort of at our fingertips. Because if you know which customers are challenging, you can actually take action, usually by pricing. Anyway, so we had all these problems, but broadly the business was a success and we sold it to Amazon. That was great. And then we worked, we worked at AWS. And the reason that the story continues here is that AWS are themselves a usage-based pricing business and probably certainly one of the largest, possibly the largest usage-based pricing business in tech. And what was reassuring was that we saw that they had all the same problems that we did, albeit on a much larger scale. And the other main difference is that they had the wherewithal to build bespoke tooling to address those challenges, to solve for those challenges. And so to, to an extent, we saw what good looks like because obviously AWS have done things well, which is one of the reasons why they've been so successful. And if you were being really reductive about what Meet is doing, it's basically delivering that level of tooling that AWS has to any SaaS business so that you can deploy and manage usage-based pricing effectively. And um, the impact of doing that is that our customers can price and sell better. And what we're delivering to them are basically two things. So on one hand, we're delivering them pricing infrastructure, which allows them to flexibly deploy usage-based pricing of any complexity. And that's basically usage metering, pricing configuration, and bill calculation. And that allows you to pump out um, usage and spend data to wherever it's needed within the, within the stack. So it'll include your billing system, but there are also your customer success tools probably the product itself so that you can share that information with your customers, et cetera. So that's one part of it is pricing infrastructure. And the other part is analytics for finance and sales teams, which helps inform customer conversations, optimize pricing and forecast the business, both revenues and profit. So there, in a nutshell, that's what we do. Usage-based pricing engine. Uh, when did the company, when did you found the company? When was it official? Uh, we left AWS in September 20 and we formally founded the company the month after. So October 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic. And, uh, so yeah, <laughs> a good time to do it. I mean, it, it, actually the pandemic hasn't been too unkind to SaaS, but I mean, it, it, I guess it could kind of depo uh, depends on who your customers were, but so sort of two years old, what, what data can you share behind the company? You, you know, give us a, a little bit more of a picture and where you are now from, you, you know, uh, from middle of 2020. So, um, I mean, broadly the first year was about building the MVP and recruiting a, a good set of design partners or a launch cohort. That launch co 
Holt started going into production um, in October last year, so about a year after we started. And then we sort of spent the three or four months after that making sure that they were onboarding, getting live properly, getting the impact that they wanted, would advocate for us. Um, and now we're in the process of pushing on and acquiring more customers. So we're, we're still at relatively early phases, but there's a huge amount of demand out there because the problems that we solve for are absolutely commonplace. And are you, are you self-funded, venture backed? Or how have you, uh, yeah, uh, how have you, what, what approach, what road have you taken so far? We, I mean, we chucked in some of our own money to start. Um, and the original idea was actually that, that was going to last us for a, for a while, at least 18 months. But um, as soon as we did that, we, one of the, sorry, one of the things you learn from working at AWS is that it's cheapest to do your thinking on paper. So make sure you properly understand the problem you're solving and make sure that there's real demand for that solution before you start cutting code and building things. So we pitched, as soon as we founded the company, we pitched into a bunch of discovery work, which is basically talking to people within our network or who were informed about the space, about what, what our aspirations were, what problem we were solving for. And one of the groups of people we talked to were VCs because you know, you, you, they're highly informed. You know, VCs that focus on SaaS will see this rise in usage-based pricing and they, they'll see the pain point that we're addressing within their portfolios. And through our contact with them, we realized that actually we could raise a seed round pretty easily, partly based on sort of founder market fit. You know, we were solving our own problem. And so we, we knew what we were mm -hmm. doing, or at least appeared to. And I think it also mattered that we'd done it before. And uh, so there, there was a lot less risk. I mean, it wasn't just, so I'm one of a, a founding team of two. Both of us are called Griffin, yep. incidentally. But uh, which, which is sometimes complicated, a bit confusing, uh, but it wasn't just us. We were actually bringing a lot of people who we'd worked with before. So a lot, there are a lot of risks that sort of were pre-mitigated around team formation. So there was a lot of enthusiasm from the VC community. And so, we, and we've ended up raising about 17 and a half million dollars of external seed funding, not all at once, but in, in sort of a series of transactions, but we see it all as part of the same, the same round. Okay. Very cool. Who's a, do you have a lead investor? I, I, I would talk about, so Kindred Capital, who are an early stage mm -hmm. fund in London, Union Square Ventures, uh, based out of New York and Insight Partners, also based out of New York. Okay. Cool. Very good. And, uh, so so the company is pretty much sort of less than 20 months old, got a good, uh, well, a bit of an understanding of obviously what you've been up to. But during these last 24 months, you know, can you share some examples of what has worked well uh, that you've been doing and maybe something that hasn't necessarily sort of worked so well um, and any lessons from that period of where, uh, from launch to where you are today? Yeah, I mean, in terms of what went well, I mean, I, I, th I think... Remember that I, I can contrast this with our first startup, which uh, we've certainly avoided lots of the mistakes we made there, which is really useful. One, one of the things we did, we've done really well at Meta is um, our discovery work. So properly understanding the problem and it requires, it requires a bit of relentlessness. I mean, you have to talk to a lot of people, you have to iterate a lot, you have to really challenge your own assumptions and keep gnawing away at things. There's quite a lot of learned behavior from AWS because, or Amazon generally, because this is a part of their culture and their, the way they approach things. But I, but I think we did, we did a good job of that, Mita. And I think it meant that what we, what we launched was instantly delightful to the customers we were trying to please, which, which was good. So I would say that was the, that was the big positive win. How, how long, how, sorry, on the, like with the customer development uh, sort of work, like how long a period did you spend on that? How many customers can you share that maybe you spoke to or your prospective customers, people that you spoke to, to kind of get you to that stage and, and deliver the product that you wanted? Um, we, I can't remember the exact numbers, but these are roughly right within 10. So we yeah. did an, an initial phase of discovery work before we cut any code. And that involved 
between 50 and 60 conversations. And, and those are more, mm -hmm. that's more than just sort of like a uh, exchange, quick exchange of views down the pub. That's a, that's a proper in-depth conversation where we talked about what we were trying to do and yeah. we got their feedback on it. And we subsequently had loads more conversations. We haven't kept track of them in quite the same way, but we, but we committed ourselves to that initial block up front and that did make a big difference. Then, then we, I don't know, I can't remember where this is video, but you, so we, we widened the funnel. We got loads and loads of input. We then wanted to focus on quite a small number of design partners or, or launch customers. So we were selecting those who wanted to, who wanted to work with us, obviously, but also who we thought were typical of, of the type of customers we wanted to go on to appeal to. So we recruited about five or six of those. And then we basically shut the doors on customer acquisition. We said, look, we don't want to, we don't want to build pipeline. We can't deliver to, we just want to work with this group, yep. build something which satisfies, hopefully delights them. And when we're confident that it does, we'll then open the, the gates again and, uh, and push for new growth. So it, it, that, if that gives you a sense of the pattern of, of what we're doing, and now we're sort of out of that phase. So now yep. we're talking, talking to loads of people again and working out what's, um, What's next? Awesome. Uh, and is, is there anything, so the, the customer development phase and, and, and what you've done in terms of speaking to the customers has worked very well. Anything that hasn't quite worked and that you've kind of like tweaked? So often there are a lot of like pivots at early stages, but you have your experience from the second or, or from the first SaaS company. But is there anything where you tried something that hasn't worked or you changed tack with the, the product or strategy at all? Yeah, I will definitely give you an example. Um, but just to check, to, it's interesting you talk about pivot because if you look at our trajectory, we've probably made lots and lots of small or tiny pivots. But I don't see that as pivoting. I just see that as learning and adapting yeah. and iterating it's right. and improving. Yeah. yeah. So um, we're kind of natural and positive. Uh, in terms of what we did... I'm glad to say, I think we've avoided all the mistakes of the first business, so, at least so far. The one thing that we did wrong or badly at Mesa is we recruited a launch cohort who were excited about what we we're building. And they, they pushed us to allow them to go into production with it. And we probably acquiesced to that slightly too early. And the consequence is that, you know, they were using a product that wasn't, it wasn't fully baked, you know, it, it didn't have like sufficient maturity to be used properly in production. Now in, in the grand scheme of things, not a huge big deal, but one of the things, because you know, we recognized it and adapted, but um, yeah, if I could, if I could have the time over again, I would have held the line a little bit more firmly with them. You know, it's tough. They're your customers. They're excited about what you're doing, but um, I would have, I would have done what was in their best interest, which is actually to say no to them at that point. Makes sense. And, and so I think you said now the, the product is kind of ready to, you, you know, properly uh, push out to market and you're looking to uh, acquire, uh, I guess, this, uh, you know, I don't know, not the test sort of customers, but, you, you know, this kind of next wave of, of customers, right? Yeah, that's right. Or we're sort of like, we're, we're down the track yeah. in that phase now, but yeah. And, and I, I should add that. And, know, and what did you... Go on, sorry, mate. No, go on. I was going to say, what's live is, so remember I talked about us having sort of two offerings. So one is the pricing infrastructure piece and the other is the analytics yeah. piece. So what's live is it's certainly the pricing infrastructure piece and the, sort of the first examples of analytics. But in terms of, you know, where our product development focuses on for the remainder of this year, it's going to be more and more on the analytics side of things. It's just that that's the sequence because our analytics are leveraging the usage um, and date, usage data and pricing data that we're onboarding with our pricing infrastructure. So one needs to follow the other. Yeah. Gotcha. M makes sense. What, what is the, the high level go to market plan? What are the, the, the kind of the, the few channels, uh, what, or one or two channels that you're kind of using to, to focus for the, the customer acquisition? So, I, uh, I mean, at, at the moment, the way we're, there's a lot of demand out there and the way we grow, uh, we, there are still some easy life hacks, like warm introductions from existing customers and VCs who recognize the problem in their portfolio. And that's, that's going to sustain us for a while. 
the um, the other key strut at the moment in our go-to-market is actually partnerships because meter isn't replacing anything in your existing stack if you're a SaaS company and you're deploying usage-based pricing for the first time you're already com be committed to your quote to cash stack which will include your your billing or your finance system and your sales crm and your customer success tooling etc and effectively what meter is doing is integrating with those tools and upskilling them for usage-based pricing and in that context there's um there's rich opportunity for us to to work with those other tooling providers in partnership so partnerships are, um, are important for us and where we're focusing our efforts at the moment are with billing and subscription management providers so I mean, publicly we have a co-selling partnership with paddle for example who are um, a big uh, payments infrastructure provider and that works great for both parties i mean we, we basically fill a feature gap for them and allow them to address customers they would otherwise struggle to to serve well so that works brilliantly for us and there are other similar opportunities like that cool it makes sense so i guess kind of speaking further then about usage based pr pricing i think we've seen or probably i've observed over i don't know it's, it's probably been longer but certainly the last 12 to 18 months you, you know it is a growing trend it's been spoken about more of than we had uh SAS local london recently and nathan lake lacker came over spoke actually it was at, at paddle's offices so we we, we know the paddle guys uh, uh so very well i think nathan made a comment saying or, or maybe somebody in the crowd said you know in a few years time it's no longer going to be called SaaS. it's going to be called like usage based as a service um so i, I don't know if you we see it you're sort of going that far but uh, we know that a lot of successful companies like snowflake and you know, so aws they're, they're they're purely you know kind of ad adopting this model so what, what do you see around this kind of trend of usage based pricing given that obviously you built products uh, you know for this and what more can you tell us about usage based pricing and whether it is for every you know is it for every SaaS company should they be looking at this i mean it, this trend towards usage base is definitely happening i mean it creates it creates the the key tailwind for our business you know, to substantiate that, I think OpenView, who are VC in the US, um, had a state, had a, a report which said in 2021, by the end of 2021, I think 45% of SaaS companies were deploying usage based pricing, which had increased 11 percentage points from 34% the year before. And there were a further 11% who planned to deploy it for the first time in, in 2022. So there's there's a lot of growth, but then it, then you sort of dig in under the skin and sort of go, what, what's what's really going going on? I mean, I, here's here's my view on this: is that I think there are three key drivers of it. I think you know, partly is just it's just state of the art. It's just um, you've had early innovators like Snowflake and AWS who've had lots of success. People are seeing it, and going, oh, that's interesting. Uh, let me try some of that as well, and it works. So, so there's just there's that sort of innovation and imitation loop that's going on. But I think there is some sort of underlying meta trends that also help drive the move towards usage based as well. And calling out two in particular. So, um, one is automation. So, uh, you know, one, one of the ways that SaaS main ways that SaaS biz, businesses have been charging is based on seats. But the more automation there is, the less the user of your service as a SaaS business is a person, and then the more likely it is that it's a machine. And as soon as you're doing that, per seat pricing begins to, to break down and you need to replace it. And usage-based pricing is a great alternative in that context. So I definitely think automation is partly driving it. And, you know, and linked to that, the whole growth of API businesses. And a lot of our customers are API businesses. I think the other, the other big trend is PLG, so product-led growth. So PLG and usage-based pricing are not the same. You, know, uh, you can have one without the other and vice versa. But they do overlap heavily because in a PLG, PLG context, usage-based pricing gives you a, a frictionless expansion mechanism. And that aligns nicely with what PLG is trying to achieve anyway. And then the other angle is in PLG context, 
customers that are success, companies that are successful, they tend to introduce targeted sales. You know, it, PLG isn't, I don't think it's anti-sales. I think it, um, successful PLG or companies tend to have targeted sales. And so you, you then get targeted sales who are doing custom deals and that drives a lot of complexity, particularly in a usage-based pricing context. So yeah, I, I mean, it, I think it's here to stay. I think, I think you're gonna see a lot of it. I, I think the key to looking at it is that there's quite purest forms of usage-based pricing. But you actually see it's really the hybrid models that I think are the most interesting in terms of really seeing this penetrate the SaaS business, the SaaS market more widely. So when I talk when I talk about pure models, I'm talking about businesses like Snowflake or AWS that are lower in the stack and providing infrastructure, and they kind of need to do usage based pricing to cover their costs. And so it's sort of like a natural choice for them. And at the other extreme, you also get sort of pure usage based, which is where the SaaS company is close to the revenue. So that they, they have sort of extreme versions of value-based pricing where they can actually take a share of the upside benefit to the, to the customer, which is easily identifiable. With, you know, extreme version of that is payments. Payments businesses charge a, a share of revenues essentially, and that's usage-based pricing. So you, you, see, you see a lot either end of, that, of the spectrum, but actually what you're seeing is lots and lots sort of in the middle, including at the application layer, where people are taking traditional sort of SaaS pricing, so feature-based or seat-based SaaS pricing, and then they're wrapping usage-based elements around it. So you know, you'll see pricing which says, well, it costs you X per seat, and that gives you an allowance of X, Y, and Z of usage with a limit. And you know, when you hit the limit, you're either throttled and have to upgrade to a new tier, or you can go over it and be charged overages. And that's usage-based pricing. And that requires all the capabilities that the pure play usage-based pricing guys require. So, so I, do think, I do think you're going to see a lot of it. I think it's going to be everywhere. I, I don't think it's the case that it's for everyone. I think you know, there are plenty of businesses that should continue with um, traditional SaaS pricing techniques, but, um, but it does work great for the people for whom it's appropriate. What is your... If we think about the next kind of 12 months and where you want to be in, in 12 months time, what is your focus or the company's focus going to be in order to get there? I mean, for us, it's all, it's all, I mean, we're still at relatively early stages, so it's proofs, you know, it's um, proving that we can repeatedly and profitably acquire new customers. It's proving that we can deliver the groundbreaking advanced analytics that um, we have planned, you know, it's a research and development based activity. We're highly confident that we're going to deliver you know, fantastic tooling, but you need to prove it. Proving that we continue to build the team well, which we've done, we've done really satisfactorily in, in Europe, but now we've got to start putting boots on the ground elsewhere in the world, which, um, you know, which is always a challenge. So we need to do, make sure that we can do that properly. So it's, I was going to use the word grind. That's completely the wrong word because it's actually fun, but it's, um, you know, it, it, we sort of know where we are and it's just a question of continuing to execute. There are no big questions to answer, but at least we hope until we run into a, you know, run into an obstacle that we weren't expecting. Yeah, it's, it's about using the word grind. I think people, we, we understand, you, you know, it is hard work, but it, it, it does, you know, have a little bit of a, a negative kind of connotation, especially as you say, you, you know, I think generally most founders, despite the hard work, you, you know, love what we do, right? And, uh, and get up every day out of bed, looking forward to the day ahead, even though we don't always know, you know, what's ahead of us, right? So, yeah, but, I, I think, but yeah, I think I, I partly use that word because, um, because our previous business was was based in games, and grind is a current, you know, is a is a term that's used widely for a, an aspect of gameplay, particularly in free to play games. And there's no suggestion that free to play games aren't fun. I mean, people play them because they're fun. But you know, it's called yeah. it's called grinding. So I guess we're in okay. that place. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I didn't know that. So also good to know. So yeah. So but look, looking at your career. So 
you've built one SaaS and exited one SaaS. So you've worked with some big companies, Sky, AWS. What are the biggest lessons that you've learned today that you can share? Uh, I mean, I've, been, I've been fortunate that I've had quite a varied career, which is quite nice. I think I'm generally the kind of person who feels like they have, still haven't properly grown up and I, you know, I enjoy learning. I enjoy doing new things. And I've been fortunate to be in environments where I, you know, I, I, I can. To, to give you, so here, here's something that I have learned. It, it was the, it was the intersection or the, the hinge between my corporate career and my sort of uh, founder career. It was really interesting. I had to go through a, a process of unlearning. There are a whole bunch of things that I did that made me effective in a corporate environment that were actively an obstacle to being effective in a more entrepreneurial environment. To give you an example, like in a corporate environment, people are quite respectful of boundaries. Like, you know, this is my job, that's your job. You know, we're all happy because we stay in our lanes. And yeah. so you sort of get into a habit where you, to do well, it's always about managing the effort of others or finding the person who knows how to do this and getting them, them to do it. And um, that's why in mid career, people stop learning quite as much because they stop doing quite as much, you know, other people are doing it for them. And I, and particularly in the early stages of GameSparks, I just had to rip all that down and go, no, look, you know, you, you have to get, there's no one else who's going to do this. You know, we're a small team. You've got to roll up your sleeves and, and get on with it. You're not above any task. And I, and I thought that was, that was really useful. And I, and I've sort of, I, I've maintained those habits since then is being humble is quite important. You know, being eager to learn being prepared to roll up your sleeves and get on with any task is important. What, what is the biggest challenge being a CEO? People, but it's also the biggest opportunity. Um, I'm a real believer in teams. I think five great people beats 50 good people. I really believe that you can create environments that um, can get good people to deliver great performance. So that's probably what I think most about finding great people, giving them an environment where they can do their best, do their best stuff. And it's challenging, but it's also really rewarding, not just personally, but in terms of impact and driving your business forward, that's the most impactful thing you can do. I was going to ask, is it, what, what is the most rewarding thing about being a CEO? So, uh, it, 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 is it that? Yeah, for sure. It's interesting because if you had, um, if, so John, who's my co-founder, and he and I are like conjoined twins. I mean, with sort of with two parts of the same people, highly complementary. His, his motivations are slightly different from mine, albeit complementary. So if you ask the same question of, of him, you know, what he finds most difficult and what he enjoys doing most and what he thinks is most impactful is, is much more product oriented than me. It's like, I, you know, we're building a, a world changing product that's going to make the lives of every SaaS business that much better. Whereas my focus tends to be much more on the, the company. You know, what I want to achieve is building a company that I'm proud of, providing a group of people with you know, a great mission and a lovely environment to pursue it in. And, and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, luckily there's two of us and we get to cover both. And that works quite nicely. Carrying on, I, I guess, kind of like around, I, I guess, you rather than the, uh, the business, like how do you improve yourself as a CEO? Uh, I guess now, you know, second time CEO. And then how do you, you keep healthy and sane along the journey? <laughs> I think learning, I mean, I think learning is constant and comes from all angles. I mean, I do think, I think good, good entrepreneurs generally are pretty curious people. Uh, 
and you know, going back to the humility point, I, I think that I think this this is quite a good quality to have as a a leader in in a business is to be humble, which means that you'll listen to everybody, believe that you can find the right answers anywhere, but also self confident because the buck stops with you and you have to make the decisions. So you don't sort of slavishly listen to others and do what they tell you. You you listen respectively and intently synthesize what you learn from a bunch of different inputs and then and then you have to make the decision but um yeah in terms of how i learn so i, I read i mean I, I talk a lot to people i i listen hard i read a lot i read quite widely you know you never know where you're going to find sort of little nuggets i like books i'm a bit old-fashioned Actually, I've, I find the best learning experiences are actually when you're sitting down with a book that you need to spend a few hours with. Because when you put it down and walk away from it, you can continue to think about it and then you come back to it later. And, and that sort of just reinforces that learning rather than just reading a blog quickly or, or whatever. I mean, in terms of keeping sane, I'm quite lucky because I just, my family is exactly the right age to keep me sane at the moment. So I've got, I've got three kids they're 16, 13, and 10. They don't need looking after that much, but they are sort of, they're interesting. Their lives are interesting. You know, just the everyday of chatting to them and my wife who does interesting things as well, that keeps me sane. But um, I do try and uh, I do try and keep fit. And I do try badly to learn Italian, which has been an ongoing process for about 15 years, which, which does help my brain work in a different way. Very good. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, so we come to the end of the show, Griff. Um, where can people find you and, and Meta uh, online? Uh, you can find Meta at Meta.com, which is spelled M3TER.com. Or you can find us um, on me or the company on LinkedIn. Very cool. Well, Griff Parry, uh, CEO, founder of, uh, of Meta, thanks so much for being on the SaaS Revolution show uh, today uh, and sharing with the SaaS community. Really appreciate it. Cool. Thank you very much for having me.